My name is Krista Eidsness. I'm the head of the Conservatory of Performing Arts, and today we have Dan Schultz with us. Dan is a musician, violinist in um, Manitoba, and he's going to tell us a little bit about himself and his life as a, as a musician. Um, as we begin today, I want to start with a uh, land acknowledgement. We are not the first people to ever make music in this place. Um, and so I welcome you, as is the tradition at the University of Regina. We are situated on the territories of the Nehewak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. Uh, the University of Regina is on Treaty 4 lands, also with a presence in Treaty 6. And so, Dan, welcome today. Thank you for joining us. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I did not do a good job of introducing you, so I might let you, would, do you wanna just introduce yourself to us and tell us a little bit about what you're doing these days? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, first thing, I'm a, a violist, not a violinist. Although I do play violin occasionally, and I play, never played it with the symphony here, but I play it in gigs and I teach it a lot and stuff. Um, I have been and am currently principal viola of the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. This is my 26th year here. Uh, I'm actually now the longest serving principal viola in our orchestra's history. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, I, I grew up in Regina, grew up in the conservatory, studied with uh, Mr. Lowe, Elman Lowe. Oh, yeah. I studied with, um, uh, my very first teacher for one year was Julia Taves, who's now out, I think, in Abbotsford somewhere. Uh, and then studied with Dr. Leighton Brown for, for one year. And the majority of my studies on viola were with uh, Ernie Cassian. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And I had a great time growing up playing music. My brother, who's three years younger than me, um, who's also a professional musician, uh, we both played violin, we both played viola, we played in the junior string orchestra, we played in the SSYO, uh, and I spent four or five years playing with the RSO as well. Wow, okay. All right, so I'm a pianist and a vocalist, so I'm not, I will just tell you, I'm not really well versed in how you learn to play the viola. So do you start with the violin or do you start right at viola? Most people start on violin and then okay. switch in their teens, sometimes later, sometimes it's university. Um, there are, however, some people that start right away on viola. It's just a, a much smaller instrument. Um, it's, you know, it's the same sort of pedagogy that we're all used to uh, on either instrument. And uh, I think it's kind of nice actually to be able to do both. It makes mm -hmm. you that much more versatile. Interesting, okay. So um, I'm gonna start with, uh, well, I've already asked questions, but that's okay. Um, I will ask, so if you have a playlist, what's on your playlist? Things My playlist is widely varied. Um, okay. I have, I have, uh, I don't know how many different versions of Bach cello suites. I have a version on viola by uh, okay. woman Lillian Fuchs who it's kind of deeply romantic Bach, but the playing is just so fierce. Like it's, mm. you have to admire it. Um, and it, I think it was, she was the very first person to record it on viola. Ah, um, okay. And it's, it's really quite stunning. She was a big teacher at Juilliard for many, many years. Okay. Um, and most of the people in Chicago Symphony and New Yorkville and San Francisco, all the big orchestras, had studied with Lillian and she was this diminutive woman who stood on a chair and yelled at her students all these tall it, in those days it was you know all young men yeah. and uh and uh, our concert master Glenn Hobig was at Juilliard when Lillian was there and she said the students were terrified every week like in the build-up to their lessons <laughs> Yeah, I, I started I've seen to, some teachers sort of, like that. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's true. Less and less now, which is good. You know, it's everything needs to evolve and develop. Yeah. Yeah, um, we have a much different approach these days. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I sometimes we get different results too, but that's that's okay. Um, so I I've as I've gone through some of these <clears> conversations, <throat> I've realized that. Um, I start with the massive question, and so I apologize for that, but I'm going to start there anyway, which is what does music mean to you? Like, so for your life, where does music fit in for you? 
music is well it's something i've always done it's it's always been a part of me um i growing up i played in orchestras but i also played trombone in um oh, the lions okay. band in oh, uh, okay Regina. so i had exposure to many different genres of music um, my friendships were all based on music activities mm -hmm. uh, and still are by and large um, it's so it's grown from something i always did and always do to now i'm teaching a lot um, as well as playing i play a lot less so this last year um, but lots and lots of teaching uh, I like teaching you know, small groups, individuals, um, older, younger, you know, seniors, kids, brand new kids who haven't started. It's, uh, it's my livelihood. So mm -hmm. it's my business. I, it's not always what I love to do and I don't sort of define myself by my career, Yeah. but it's something that I do and I have been very fortunate to do it with really great people um, and in, in great situations. So are there things, okay, so I'm gonna ask this next question a little bit differently than it's. So are there things you're more passionate about in that in that career of music than other things? Like I, in every job, there's things you don't like. That mm -hmm. I, I'll just say yeah. that, in, you know, yeah. in every job that's gonna happen. So there are gonna be things I'm guessing in music that are not your favorite to do, but are there things that you're more passionate about than others? I think there are things, yes, there are things I really, I look forward to those events every week as they happen. Um, we have, there, there's two main things right now in my life that I really look forward to. One is chamber music. Mm. We have a quartet where it's myself, the principal cellist of the symphony, concertmaster and assistant concertmaster. And we have played together now for I think 19 years. Wow. Just the four of us. Yeah. And we had, there was a different uh, cellist in it before that. Um, so that is, that is a real joy to be able to do. We've done some recordings this year. We've done a complete Beethoven cycle. We've done just about all of the chamber music that Mozart has written. Um, the concert master's partner is a pianist. Mm. So we have our own series. We, we play, I think I, I put it on a, a CV I did last year. I think I have played about 3000 chamber music concerts since I've arrived here. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. So being able to do that uh, and the, the variety of things outside of the orchestra is, it, it makes me very appreciative and I never get tired of, okay, I'm only doing this. I'm only playing Beethoven symphonies. Mozart symphonies, Brahms symphonies, or Bruckner, or whatever. Yeah, I it every week there's something different for me. So as a okay, so I'm guessing after 19 years, you guys know each other and how you play really well, right? Oh, yeah. And so it's so it's it's become yeah, that's amazing. And do you and, get to, you get to choose your own music that way too, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, some things are thrown in front of us, um, like we'll. We've done commissions at the New Music Festival that Symphony has commissioned, and we do those, um, which is always interesting too because we get to set, you know, the first performance. Mm -hmm. This is sort of there's a little bit of uh, not ingenuity. Well, ingenuity, yes, but you know, you kind of set the the standard for it moving forward. Um, cool. Yeah, and the other thing I really love doing, I conduct the Senior Youth Orchestra. Oh, okay. And I, I just love that. I love the energy that the kids have, the enthusiasm they bring, the ideas, um, you know, both repertoire, artistically, they're, they work their tails off. They really do, because at that level, they have to. Yeah, yeah. So have you been doing that through the pandemic? Like, we have. What have you been, what have you been doing? Um, we had in-person rehearsals from September until the first week of November when everything mm -hmm. got shut down again. And then what we did, we had Zoom rehearsals. Oh, so really? So we would okay. play 
with one person who was playing, like we'd have one person in the yeah. orchestra turn on their mic. Uh, we would play with recordings. Um, and the, the interesting thing about YouTube is that you can set the speed, you can play it at 75, 50, 25 percent. So we yeah. could actually learn things. Um, and the kids, you know, they're they're playing to themselves, but they're hearing the recording or they're hearing me. Uh, I played along a lot of the yeah. times. Um, we discussed different recordings. What was, what did they like about it? What did they not like? What would they like to try and do with this? And then uh, our concert master actually wrote us a piece this year. He wrote a piece that is exactly for our instrumentation. We had one rehearsal on it in person and then the doors all got closed. <laughs> but what we did, um, and his name is River. Uh, River put a, made a MIDI file out of it and put a click track to it. So we, have, we recorded it. Every, everybody recorded it on their own. And then River and uh, Sophie, one of our other violinists, they did all the audio and video editing and put together this production. It's about a 13 minute work. It's spectacular. The first time I watched it, I had tears rolling down my eyes. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I should send, I'll send you the link. Yes, and then you can do that. put the link on. We'll put, this. we'll put the link with the video because that would be great to see. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. sent it to um, Al Nike and I've sent it to Saskatoon and Calgary and Toronto. So a lot of kids may have seen it, but you know what? If parents haven't seen it or something. Exactly. Like that or other exactly. teachers. Exactly. So yeah, we did the that. pandemic, it's definitely pushed us to go where we didn't think we would ever go, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is nice, you know, we need to be growing. Yeah, um, yeah. And so we kept rehearsing. And then I think three weeks ago, we actually got to go back in person. Oh, nice. Um, and it was, a, it was a revelation for me because we're doing two concertos and Beethoven Fourth Symphony the kids could play it they'd actually worked at it they practiced <laughs> it has it was effective um you know and we don't have everybody in person we have some coming over zoom still just because of yeah. safety concerns and health reasons and family yeah. and stuff um and our goal is i think it's two weeks or three weeks is our spring concert oh so nice. we're, gonna, we're gonna film it those that can't be there they can they'll film it on their own and we'll merge the two Wow. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah, you know, we've been doing a similar kind of thing with our church choir and our choir director was sure we could never get anything together, but she has found the same thing. If we sing along with whatever she's doing and then we get together, mm -hmm. it, it actually doesn't take a whole lot. It doesn't take as much time nearly as, as she expected yeah. to get us together again. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, we're, maybe we're learning something about how we learn music too. It, you know at the yep. same time like this is this may be opening up new avenues for people it would be interesting it's oh now that you've said that it's an interesting thought for people who live in rural areas it would be interesting to maybe be able to expand an orchestra to include people that could only maybe come in for a week or two ahead of the concert because they didn't it's live true. close by that yeah. would be yeah yeah it does make make things quite a bit more accessible yeah yeah, interesting. Okay, so I will go back to my questions. And um, so how did you get started on the viola? I got started on the viola. I can remember it vividly. Um, I was studying with Mr. Lowe at the time. Mm -hmm. And there was a chamber, a week-long chamber music program that was going to be held at, I think it's, was, is it St. Mary's? It's on... Oh, is down in the Cathedral? Anglican Church? Or the... St. Paul's Cathedral is downtown. Yeah, it, there was a, a school attached to it. I think it was a Catholic church, but I could be mistaken. Uh, who knows? Yeah. Anyway, okay. Um. So, and all of his sons were coming back to teach at it. Oh, okay. And he said, uh, "Damn, you know, we don't have any violas." And I was, you know, I don't know. I didn't really enjoy playing the violin. I sat in the back of the seconds at youth orchestra. I don't know. I just didn't feel very motivated. Yeah. There. He said, well, why don't you try playing viola and see, see what you think? Uh, and he said, we don't really have, there's maybe one other violist a little bit younger than you. So give it a shot. Let's see. So we had 
a few lessons, learned to read the clef, enough to go to the camp. I loved it. I loved the sound of it. I loved the size of it. It just, that was my voice. It fit me. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I never looked back, never went back to violin. Wow. Okay. So, so tell me a little bit about then. Um, so is the music different for viola? Like, like I know it's written in a different class, but I mean, like you get, it, I, I'm assuming in orchestras, cause it was this way in kind of concert band when I was in high school. Like if you play the oboe, you get this kind of line. And if you play the clarinet, you get this kind of line and the same with the flute. Is it this, is that similar in a viola v violin kind of way? Like, is there a typical kind of viola line? There, there is, yes. Um, if you think of the string section of an orchestra um, or it, less so in a quartet, but say orchestrally, um, violin uh, usually has the melody, first violins. Uh, Celli, a lot of very lyrical, melodic writing as well. Violas, second violins, we kind of fill in, we fill in all of the harmonic things. We are, we're kind of in between the cracks all of the time. We never really, mm. you know, typically it's first position, third position, fifth position. You play viola and second violin, you're kind of in half, second <laughs> and fourth, because that's where, that's where all of the, the harmonic division lies and then all of a sudden we have to play with the first violins and then we have the melody on our own then we're back to a, a supportive role then we have the melody with the cello or with the clarinets or the bassoons so it's it's like this awesome. like you have to be you're always uh, have to be ultra aware all the time yeah and i love sitting in the middle of the orchestra or playing in the middle of the orchestra and hearing how we fit in with everybody yeah yeah, I've I've sung both alto and soprano in choirs, and when I was singing alto, we always kind of like, oh, the sopranos are like they just never think about anything <laughs> because yeah. they always have the melody. And I I enjoy singing alto more than singing soprano, just because I like to be able yeah to fit in. Which so it's interesting that that happens in orchestras too. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Okay, and it's amazing how much kind of how much control there is. In those inner voices mm -hmm. and if you have strength and stability inside then yeah. it allows the melodic voices that much more freedom to play yeah as well. yeah and it's straight th it strengthens the whole structure i think yes, of yes. the sound right yeah. yeah interesting okay so you've told us a little bit about you we know you studied at the conservatory what, what did you do after high school after high school, I went to U of R. Ah, okay. Um, I, well, I was studying with Ernie Cassian at that time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, I, I'm really enjoying my lessons. Um, I think I'm going to continue. Uh, and I, I, my degree is a Bachelor of Music Education. Oh, so okay. I have my teaching certificate. I don't have a performance degree. Okay. Um, and then about halfway through, was it? Yeah, after my second year, I did a summer of, it was Congress of Strings run by the union at that time. It's, that program doesn't go anymore. There were three Canadians at it and the rest were Americans. Uh, it was in Detroit, right in downtown Detroit. Um, <laughs> we had wonderful coaches and then all of these kids from all over the States and they were all in music programs doing a bachelor wow. of music or masters of music. And I sat down in the orchestra and looked around. I thought, you know, I can play every bit as well as these people. Hmm, maybe I should look at that. Um, and then Ernie went on sabbatical and he said, uh, and then he came back. I, while he was on sabbatical, he gave me the junior orchestra. Okay. So I started doing that, sort of teaching those, those kids. Um, he came back and he said, Dan, you have to go study with, uh, his name was Jerry Stanek out at UBC. Okay. And so then my last year in Regina, well, last year and a half in Regina, I would fly to Vancouver once a month for lessons. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, and that was eye-opening. He was a pedagogue among pedagogues. Like, wow. 
Uh, and there was a couple of kids from Regina that were out there. So I'd fly out for the weekend, have lessons all the time, sleep in somebody's kitchen and, and then come home. And it, it was, it was really, it was so much fun to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, it was encouraging to have my teacher at that time say, yeah, go, go to Montreal, have some lessons, go to Vancouver and have some lessons. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I used to drive out to Winnipeg and have lessons too just to have different experiences with people. Yeah. And now you see all of these kids doing it on Zoom. Like I've, I've had lessons with people from China and Taiwan, the States, from Europe, yeah. all over Canada. Yeah. It's so easy to do now. And it's so much more accessible, right? Like yes. you, can, you, can, you can do it if you're on a budget. You don't have yeah. to worry about the money and having somebody to stay with when you get there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and taking yeah. three days out of your schedule to yeah. go and get two lessons. Yeah, exactly. Oh, interesting. Okay, so you, so did you graduate? You graduated from U of R. Graduated from U of R, and I went and worked in Saskatoon. Okay. I was principal of Viola there for a year and taught in the Suzuki program. Okay. And I did that for a year, and I thought, okay, this is very similar to what I grew up with. So I went to McGill for a year, and did a, an artist diploma there. Ah, okay. And then went to UBC and I was in Vancouver for two years and I was about two classes shy of my master's degree <laughs> and I got the job here and UBC wouldn't let me finish it. They said, you oh. I had to be out there full time. I said, well, I've got a full time job. I'll fly out once a month, do a directed studies or I'll come in the summer. Yeah. Just let me finish it. And there was no go. So. And that's where but, you left. know that you said you've been there for 26 years right yeah uh, yeah the, I think the universities have had to had to shift their positions on a lot of that stuff these days because yeah. people are so much more mobile and yes. and they're now in a much more competitive market than they were maybe mm -hmm. 26 years ago yeah interesting yeah. interesting so you've been settled in Winnipeg for 20 26 years both 26 involved? years yeah wow so what does what does a typical and I will say typical and we can think pre-pandemic, what does a typical is there a typical work day for you in it it's widely varied. Um, okay. because I I play symphony. I was playing the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra. We did chamber music. I was teaching um, both privately here in my studio and at the university, doing some chamber music coaching there. Um, and even the symphony schedule is so mm. um, um, not unpredictable, but wildly scheduled all over the time. Yeah, there would be days where okay, a typical day, um, if it's just a masterwork symphony classical concert, we rehearse on a Wednesday afternoon, twice on Thursday, dress on Friday morning, show Friday night, Saturday night, and then Sunday maybe dress uh, rehearsal for a kid's show and then a kid's show Sunday afternoon. You guys are busy. And it's busy. And then maybe it's ballet the next week. So then it's two rehearsals on Monday, rehearsal Tuesday morning, dress rehearsal Tuesday night, and then six shows back to back in the evenings. So that's the thing that we don't have in Regina is we don't have a ballet company. And so yeah. that had not occurred to me. The, so is it the it's the it's the Winnipeg Symphony that plays both their own concerts and for the ballet? Is that right? That's correct, and for the opera. Oh, and you have an oh my gosh, okay. Yeah. So you guys are really busy then. We're really busy, and typically on an opera week because the days are more or less free, they'll put in chamber orchestra concerts, or we'll have chamber music, or it's both. So then we look at Monday as a double, and then I would go to youth orchestra. And then Tuesday morning and afternoon would be the chamber orchestra rehearsals. Tuesday night, there's a four hour opera rehearsal. Then it's MCO the next morning, MCO concert that night. Then the dress rehearsal, the sits, or yeah, the dress rehearsal for the opera. Then a day off, which may or may not have something else in it. And then the opera on a Saturday and the Tuesday and a Friday. And with, somehow you, you squeeze teaching in there too teaching in there and in between oh my yeah. goodness yeah that's a busy schedule so when do you practice do you get to practice um 
you have to be very um, faithful about it and just kind of squeeze it in up early doing it. Um, or you spend a lot of time at rehearsals being very mindful, being very thoughtful. And not only are you rehearsing, but you're, you're practicing as well. Interesting. So can you tell me a little bit more about what that means for you? Like if you're mindfully rehearsing and practicing at the same time, like are you, if, yeah, what, how do you do that? Um, you're always going in, everything has to be prepared ahead mm -hmm. of time. Um, and it's nice when I've gotten to this point, I, there's not many things I haven't played. So I don't have to, you know, with a, a symphony, I don't have to sit down and go through it page by page by page by page. I know where the most troublesome spots are. So mm, I can just okay. zero in on that. And then when you're in rehearsal, yes, you're, you're always listening to your colleagues. You're listening to whoever's on the podium. Um, but you also have to be tuned into what you are doing. You can't just sit down and play like a robot. Yeah. And I find that can be time very, very well spent. Hmm. You know, you're paying attention. Yes. Is my, is my vibrato, am I being vibrating too much? Am I not vibrating enough? Is it matching those people around me? Um, what am I hearing from the section behind me? Do I need to say anything or is there something I can do physically that would help the section play a little bit more together? There's, well, it's like any, any musical event or activity. There are just 8 million different kinds of <laughs> things coming at you and yeah. you have to, you can't be aware of them all of the time, but you have to be, your radar really has to be going always. So it's a it's a whole skill set that you develop on top of the solo work that you that you maybe started with as a child, right? Like when you start and you're really well, I guess in Suzuki you're playing in group anyway, but you're all mm -hmm. trying to match your tone, like you're trying to match the same notes when you're first starting. Um, yeah. And then I think a lot of our students do a lot of solo work, but what you're describing is. It, it's a whole other skill set of listening to others and yourself and thinking about how all the pieces fit together is that that's that's something beyond what you might think about when you're just in a studio with your teacher playing by yourself mm -hmm. it yeah. is and and even you know we've been playing as a quartet together for 19 years we just recorded uh, death and the maiden the Schubert, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago and in our rehearsals leading up to that we spent hours on slow, methodical work, whether it's articulation, intonation. Um, you know, it's it's not all of a sudden you get to be playing for 20 years and you play perfectly in tune all of the time. Yeah. Everybody's got a little <laughs> bit different perspective about, okay, I want this note a little higher or I'm playing an open string. So everybody's gonna have to match it. It's Interesting. Whoa. Ultra awareness, yeah. There's a lot of moving pieces in there. There is, yeah. Yeah, even in a quartet. That's crazy. Yeah. I had not thought of that. <laughs> As I said, I'm a pianist. So I, you know, like I don't, people tune to me because I can't. Yes, tune them, yeah. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> I had not thought of all those things. Wow. Okay. That's, that's a little bit, that's a lot to be aware of and mindful of in a rehearsal. It must, you must have, you must have to develop great um, focus. Is yes, that, yeah? you do. Yeah. yeah. You can't be just playing along in the middle of something and going, hmm, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? <laughs> yeah. Because you look back down at the page you and well. go, I have, I have no idea where I am anymore. <laughs> um, so as you were growing up, was this something you dreamed of doing or what made you choose to become a professional musician? You know, I always, I'm not sure I ever really dreamed about it. Um, like I was saying earlier, it wasn't even until I was gonna teach music. Mm. That was, I'd always had great teachers, both in the school system and private lessons, uh, 
the instructors at the at the Lions Band, every every person I came into contact, well, almost every person I came into contact, there was something inspirational about it. Hmm. They treated people nicely. They, you know, encouraged you. They gave you hell when you needed it. There was, it was just such a positive experience. And I thought, I think I can do that. Um, and then I got a little bit more into the industry and realized that it, I didn't have to only choose this. Ah. I could, I could be, I could have a little broader um, look at, at my life. Interesting. So, because you grew up in Regina, so you, and you said you played with the symphony here. So you mm -hmm. kind of knew what the, what a symphony player's life, or at least from a, a periphery kind of sense, you might know a little bit about what they did as a, as a life. So what was it that you saw that, that you went, oh, I could do more than teach in a school. I could do more than, I could do more. What was it that kind of, what did you see? Well, it was, it was partially there, a little bit of working in Saskatoon. Uh, and then I did a lot of gigs in Montreal when I was there. And when I was in Vancouver, I played with Vancouver Symphony for two years. Mm -hmm. And I played at the opera there. I played with CBC Radio Orchestra and gigs, as many as I possibly could do, because even then Vancouver was expensive for rent. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but the, just the, the variety of people you get to play with. Um, and you see everybody doing a little bit different things, whether they have a full-time orchestra job or they are a freelancer or they are mainly a teacher, but they play a little bit or they, the bulk of their livelihood is chamber music. It was eye-opening to see that you, okay, you could do that kind of solely and just bring in a few things here and there, or there was people that were doing everything and they weren't you know, they weren't widely scattered or anything. They just seemed to have it all together. Interesting. I liked that variety of, of things. Um, my dad, there's nobody else in my extended family that people are musical, but nobody ever thought about it as a, a career. And there's, I come from a family of three. Okay. And we're all professional musicians. Really? <laughs> Yeah, and in fact, like my brother Rich is a trumpet player in Calgary and Red Deer, and Michael, my youngest brother, plays in the viola section here with me in Winnipeg. Uh, and my parents were so happy. They just Dad said, "Oh, you're never going to be stuck in a cubicle." He said, "It's That's always going to be." He said, "It might be more challenging, uh, you know, from a." longevity or uh, an economic standpoint, but you're never gonna really, you're not gonna be bored with it. Yeah, and was he right about that? Have you ever been bored with it? No, I've never been bored. No, no. no. It's, as you were speaking, I was, I was thinking like, it's almost like, you know, they, uh, there's a saying about autism where you've met one autistic person, that means you've met one autistic person. And you could almost say the same thing about musicians. You've met one musician means you've met one musician. You don't, you don't know all of them because no. the way you're describing it, like everybody puts it together in their own way. And so that creativity of that comes through their music also comes through the way that they live and how they put their life together. It's interesting. Yeah. 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 So, okay, you've been at the Winnipeg Symphony 26 years. You've been playing with your quartet for 19 years. Um, what changes have you seen or experienced in that, in that career time or even before that when you're playing with Saskatoon and Vancouver? Have you seen changes either in the society around you or in the way that, that the music business has evolved? Hmm. Yeah, I, I have seen changes uh, as... I would say I'm busier now. We oh, all really? Are. Yeah. Wow. Uh, when I first came to Winnipeg, um, and I was the youngest person in the orchestra for probably three, four years, something like that. And now that is no longer the case. There's <laughs> lots and lots of young, very young people, like right out of school. Um, it's when I first came, I think we used, like we have a, a number of services, like it's 350 or 375 
over the our contract over the year that they can use and they would there was at least a third of them that weren't used mm. at least and now it's all of them and if they could get more services if they could find more money to pay us more give us more weeks they would fill them interesting and now sort of on the flip side of that all of the extra gigs that we used to do are kind of evaporating a little bit and the symphony is swallowing them up really yeah oh because it's for you know uh, say you you're running a, a choir yeah and you want to hire the symphony and stuff it's it's expensive it's you've got a little board here every choir has their own little board and some of those choirs are now amalgamating so that it's a little bit more efficient to run yeah. as a, an organization. Yeah. And a lot of the members were, the you know, the choristers were the same too. Yeah. So, and then Symphony, instead of, you know, us doing freelance gigs for six different choirs, now it's three choirs or two choirs, and they've got a little bit more resources and they just come to the Symphony and say, this is what we want. Here's what, here's the money we have. Interesting. And so, and wow. I would not have thought that. It's an interesting trend. Yeah. See, because I, because what I was thinking was that, I mean, one of the big myths, and I don't know, I don't, or one of the, I don't know if it's a myth. I will call it a myth for now. One of the big myths is that, is that classical music is like, is like, is like down here in terms of popularity. And then there's like the big money maker music over here that does its thing. And that classical music therefore has to continue to innovate in order to survive. And I don't know if that's true, but like, if you're, if you, if you guys are busier than you were before, mm -hmm. now part of it is doing some of the same work in a different way, but that's still. It is. And we're doing a lot more educational work as well. Ah, where okay. Musicians and smaller groups are going out to schools, uh, you know, prior to the pandemic. Now it's yeah. all, video productions that are being sent to the schools um lots of big movies we that's newish over the last few years where we okay. play the scores for harry potter movies or yeah. home alone and things yes. like that and those are big money makers it yeah brings people into the hall um exposes them to a live concert yeah. and and people there's a lot of people they're finding that will come and see just the symphony you go oh I really like that I love that um and the intensity and the the impact of it right now yeah so who was oh I was talking to Tamsin Johnson last or no it wasn't Tamsin no Anna Norris last week and she had she had played with the Sudbury Symphony for a while I think it was or she's yeah Sudbury I think and she said that that one of the things they did was go out to mm -hmm. rural communities and she said when she was with them, that they would go out and they do, you know, set up and do a concert. And, and she said it was always full. And yeah. so part of, I, like, part of, I think that whole, like trying to get people in the doors to listen to a Harry Potter or whatever, and then they discover they like it. Part of it is about exposing them to that live experience, right? Yeah. Because when I was talking to Anna about it, I was saying, you know, like, it's kind of like, I heard somebody speaking about, you think back to like when Beethoven wrote, the ninth symphony, the people that heard it had never heard it before and would likely never hear it again, right? Like, like it's not like they could go home and listen to it on their iPod, right? Like this was a once in a lifetime experience to hear that symphony. And so in some ways for people in small towns mm -hmm. to hear a live orchestra without having to drive three or four hours to go find it, that might be like a, at least, a, if not a once in a lifetime, at least once once that year kind of experience. And so for people mm -hmm. coming in, you know, if you can get them in the door with Harry Potter and expose them to something that they like, oh, I liked that. Then it becomes, oh, well, maybe I could go again. Yeah. 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 Interesting. I even see that with uh, youth orchestra. And a few years ago, we had, I had two kids from a, a high school, obviously a really good music program at the school. And uh, the kids were, ultra talented and they had never heard anything like this like you get band kids in and they go there's kids in the city that play violin yeah wow this is cool yeah 
uh, the next year, he brought he brought a bunch of kids to you know his friends to the concert that we did in spring, and about eight of them auditioned for the next year. Wow! So we had this whole big group of it, and you know some of the parents are hanging around, either at concerts or at the end of a rehearsal, and the parents are just like, I've never heard anything like this. Does is there other things like this in the city? Oh yeah, wow. you should come check out Symphony. Oh okay, yeah we will. You know, and the, and the kids had never heard it either, but we get them exposed or they get exposed to it and they make friends with the other kids in the orchestra and they go, oh yeah, okay, we're all, you know, we can play video games, but I can sit down and play the violin or play the trumpet or yeah. percussion or whatever. Wow. Yeah. It really is a community. I mean, that's what, that's partly what you said about like your friends are all musicians, like your, most of your friends are musicians. It does really become about building a community. It and, does, yeah. and and welcoming new people into that community as they come along and go oh oh that speaks to me yeah, yeah. interesting yeah. um so okay uh, we have i think we have about 10 minutes uh, five to ten minutes left so i will say um other than um that's oh yeah i was i will ask this one other than being able to play your instrument so other than being able to play the viola uh, what other skills did you learn need to learn along the way to become the musician that you are today? Are there other skills beyond viola that you had to kind of pick up on the way to being who you are? Uh, being organized, mm. responding in time, being organized. Um, and, you know, there are, you mentioned it, at, I think in sort of your introduction, talking about uh, the business aspect of it. Um, I wish that we have been exposed to that. Mm. There needs to be a class or two or a minor even yeah. just to just to sit down and do your taxes. Oh, yes. Like I end up, I, I'm not like my brother-in-law who has one employer, he gets his T4A and then he's done. I have, you know, folders full of receipts. I think I get 12 T4As yeah. every year. Just to be able to keep track of that and not just at the end of the year, but learning how to to do that on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. Yeah. yeah. I, that would have been very beneficial and would have saved me a lot of headache at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've often I've often thought that myself, having having learned it the kind of through experience. I'm like, I wish somebody had showed me how to do this earlier, <laughs> like yeah. how to, and how to keep track of things. Because I know, I know lots of musicians that don't know how to answer their phone, it seems, <laughs> or respond to emails, right? And so that being organized piece would be really helpful to them as that's, you know, they're like, no, I want to make a living as a musician. I'm like, you could do a lot better if you would respond when people ask you to do things, you yes. know? Yes, yeah. Like you the could immediacy actually, of that. Yeah, or or actually, if you would just let us pay you, because we struggle with this at the conservatory, we like we did <laughs> the craziest thing. It's like if you would tell us when you worked, we'd be happy to pay you for it. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah. it's chasing people down, and I know it's some of it's that creative. Oh, no, I'm not focused on the financial piece, but it's but there is a there is a business aspect to that. There is a side of that. That, yeah. that yeah that if you want to survive and not starve that you know pay your rent and pay your grocery bills and yeah there's that little piece that would be really helpful i think yeah, for all yeah. of us yeah there's a, a school in the states it's um mercer college mm. in macon georgia just okay. outside of atlanta yeah and uh one of well our concert master's daughter is there and our my youth orchestra concert master he's going to go there next year they, the kids do a music degree and their minor is in business. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, they can deal with all the organization and administration of keeping their careers, their lives in balance. Yeah. Yeah. And I was talking to a voice, uh, a vocalist a while ago, and a lot of her income comes from grants. And so here in Canada, and she said it's very different in the States. So in <laughs> Canada, it would almost be good to have a course on how do you write grants too? Like how, yeah. how do you write these? What is the process? What do you do to get this kind of money? Yeah, yeah, be interesting. 
Awesome. Well, I think we're at about our time, Dan. So okay. I will say thank you very much for sharing with us today and uh, sharing your life a little bit. Is there anything I didn't ask you about that you really wanted to tell us? I don't I don't think so. No? Okay. Just Most of the time practicing. people don't have anything. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, just, you know, do what you, you got to you have to like what you do. Yeah. You know, and every time you pick up, an instrument you want to make you want to love the sound you're making it doesn't mm. matter what your instrument is always yeah. that's i think that we could all strive for that more and more just you have to kind of fall in love with what the sound that you're producing because then it entices others to do so that's all that's a great place to end so thank you very much i'm gonna stop the recording